What is a scary, unsettling fact about you? I pooped in my neighbor's backyard when I was eight years old, just gargoyled under his jungle gym and let loose. This is the first time I've talked about it in over 20 years. Story two, that I woke up in the middle of surgery and threw a mayo pan at a nurse before they pinned me back down and upped my dosage of sedatives. Keynote, I still had retractors in, so I briefly looked like a dead space enemy. I have a spotty memory of it. Sedation is very hit and miss with me. This has happened three times already. Once during surgery, during a nerve burn where I never went out, I was just paralyzed for about three minutes and then started speaking during the procedure, and the last time was during colonoscopy that was seriously painful, and I asked the doctor if he was an old scout leader. He laughed and then asked the nurse if I was within range for another dose of sedative. Story 3 I do not actually remember a decent chunk of my life. Whenever I talk about most of my childhood, I use words that leave room for mistakes and am generally using memories and ideas I've compiled from hearing other people say things about me. There are actually a large chunk of facts about myself that I only think I know and don't have personal confirmation of. Story 4 I'm a millionaire because my grandmother died and no one knows about it. I inherited a lot of money from my grandmother about two years ago that no one in my family knew existed. I still don't know where it came from, her lawyer wouldn't tell me, but it's in the upper seven figures. My father got the flat she owned and we all thought that was everything she had. Apparently it wasn't. But I haven't told anyone about it and I don't plan on doing so either. I just work a normal eight to five desk job rent a cheap flat downtown of the city I live in, and live a normal life on my own. No partner or children, no expensive vacations, I don't even have a car. I just don't feel comfortable sharing this secret, and the longer I keep it, the stranger it would get telling it. Story 5 When I was 18 years old, I was incarcerated for three years, found not guilty, and was acquitted on all charges. I had roughly 12 charges, some of which would have led to life in prison had I been found guilty. But I knew I was innocent and decided to fight my case. My best friend at the time was found guilty and given three life sentences. At one point, one and a half years in, the DA offered me seven years and two felony strikes as a deal, or I could roll on my best friend and go home that same day. I passed and had to continue to fight my case, as I knew they didn't have any solid evidence against me. As my parents ran out of money for an attorney, I was eventually given a state-appointed attorney who fought for me tooth and nail. He kicked ass and listened to everything I presented to him about why I wasn't guilty. Mind you, I was 18, and I was surrounded by grown men and saw some horrific stuff. I kept in contact with my attorney afterward and informed him that I was still doing well out here, but he died a couple of years ago. Now don't get me wrong, I was no saint. I was in a gang and running the streets and up to no good. But I wasn't guilty of these charges. A part of me felt that maybe it was the universe's way of slowing me down and helping me get my life together. It took a short while, but I've been on the right track. This February will be 20 years since I've been released. I'm glad that experience led you to getting your life together, but it's a true shame that the justice system fails so many people. It's supposed to be innocent until proven guilty but unfortunately for many, it's simply not. Story 6. I have a tendency to self-isolate, and it's damaged some very long-term friendships because people don't understand that it's not them, it's me, and that I really mean no harm or have any ill feelings towards them. I just want to recede into my own mind. I feel really bad about it and keep telling myself to reach out, but I don't. Story 7. My dog and my mother died in the same year, and I was so devastated when my dog passed. That kind of pain didn't even compare to the pain of losing my mom, partially because she had given up on me and life years before she died. She drank herself to death and got sepsis, and my dad died in 2002. I'm 38 now and I miss them, but I miss my dog more. She was always there for me through so much illness and loneliness and pain. She was my best friend. Story 8 I don't know if scary and unsettling quite fits here, but if I met you three years ago and then haven't seen you since then, I will remember your name and several random things you told me. I've had to learn to play dumb and act like I don't remember certain things because it creeps people out and gives off a stalkery vibe. 
though it is useful when I want to screw with someone. I've always found this ability in some people to be very neat. I'm kind of flattered or amazed that they remembered my name when I can't even recall ever meeting them. I can see how some people would find that unsettling, though. Story 9. I honestly barely know myself. If someone asks me about what I do or what I like, etc., I legitimately have no idea. Story 10. I'm slowly leaving society and don't plan to tell anyone. I purchased a small piece of property, one small cabin in which I'll live at, and a second that has been remodeled for use as a rental to subsidize my income. I have around two years of work left and have no intention of telling anyone either. My parents are both dead, and my brother has been estranged for two decades. When I hit my monetary goal in a couple of years, I'm just not showing up for life anymore. I've deleted all socials aside from Reddit, as I use it for news and information to stay current until I leave the grid. My phone will also be left behind. I plan to take a laptop to communicate with the rental agency and any issues with renters that may arise, as I plan to act as the caretaker of said rental. I'm walking away from it all. Work, friends, any and all obligations. The world tires me and I see no point in continuing to be part of it on any real scale. Completely understandable. However, I would at least formally resign from work. Or let the police or one person know as you wouldn't want to end up being listed as a missing person and tracked down by the police. I hope you enjoy your retirement in peace, OP, and that it fulfills you in ways life hasn't so far. Story 11. From ages 6 to 14, I spent all of my time in a pitch-black, cold, and locked basement, only leaving for school and never letting anyone outside of my family know. Story 12. I had a metal bolt roughly an inch and a half long stuck in my right lung from the ages of 2 to 17. I must have put it in my mouth as a toddler and it got in there somehow. Anyway, the unsettling bit is that I always knew there was something seriously wrong with my body because my whole life I would have instances in which I coughed uncontrollably, many times coughing up blood, sometimes a little, sometimes a lot, but I never told anyone. My dad was neglectful and my mom was always working, so it was relatively easy to hide. If it happened at school, I'd excuse myself to the restroom until it stopped. No one ever showed any concern during those 15 years, so I guess I kept it to myself well enough. I never told anyone because even as a small child I was very unhappy with life and wanted it to be over. I guess I figured my mystery illness would get me eventually, so I kept it a secret so I wouldn't get treated. It all came to a head when I was 17 while playing ball at the park with my parents, siblings, and some friends. I got a decent hit and ran around the bases when I started coughing. After sitting back down I tried to hold it in but I couldn't and this time it was too bloody to hide and there was no bathroom to go to. My step-uncle noticed after a minute or two and everyone crowded around me while I'm coughing up a ton of blood in and around a trash can. My little brother told me after that they actually sent guys in hazmat suits to clean it up because they didn't know if whatever was wrong with me was contagious. But anyway, I got to the hospital and got an x-ray which showed the screw lit up like Christmas, imposed over my rib cage. The doctor just went, well, there's your problem. I guess he was trying to lighten the mood since everyone was understandably freaking out. Two weeks of surgery, three total, and it was out. I still have breathing issues, but the cough is gone now. I made the screw into a necklace which I wear sometimes because I find it oddly comforting to be reminded of my own mortality. I know that's weird, but it's just sort of how I am, all things considered. I never told my family that I knew there was something wrong with me because telling them would mean admitting to them that I wanted to die the whole time. I still struggle with mental health crap for this, and many, many other reasons I won't get into, but things are a lot easier than they used to be. I cannot imagine going that long with something embedded in my lung. Just the thought of something being physically wrong inside my body scares me, and I would be getting it checked out. Story 13 Despite me being in a good situation, Right now I could pack up all my stuff and run off and be completely okay with not seeing my partner, family, or friends ever again and just start over. Probably a useful skill hundreds if not thousands of years ago. Not so useful now. Story 14. 
I'm convinced with no evidence that my father is still alive and that my whole family is lying to me. I logically know he is not. Every knock on the door, I open half expecting my father. It could be something to work through, but it's not really affecting me day to day. My grandfather died and I thought I would feel the same way. Nope. He is dead and I miss him, but he is dead. Story 15. When I was about 10 years old, I threw a wooden ball at my brother's head while we were fighting. He was walking by our stairs at the time and fell down, hit his head on the tile, and was knocked unconscious. There was a blood splatter under his head. I backed up into the other room and returned to watching TV, pretending like I hadn't seen anything. My mom heard the thud and found him. I only went to see what was up after I knew I wouldn't be the first down those stairs. He was totally fine. The splatter looked like way more blood than it was, and he had barely a scratch on him. He didn't remember how he fell. I really thought I had killed him, and my first thought was how I could get out of any consequences. Not sure what that says about my character. Story 16. I joined the army on a whim. I have five years left on my contract, and I've always fantasized about running away or hurting myself to get out of my situation. The pressure I feel to pay for my college and the support I get from family and friends makes things even more difficult because I don't want to be a failure. This right here is unfortunately a design built into the system, and not an accidental flaw. The education system is kept expensive to encourage more people to enter into the military ecosystem, and keep them until they either finish school or drop out, and have no choice but to stay in their current situation. I hope things improve drastically for you in the future, and you get your spot in life where you feel content and comfortable. Story 17 I'm creepily silent in general and always have been. I sneak up on people regularly without trying. I'll walk up to a group and those not facing me tend to be jump-scared. I've walked through rooms of people without being seen, only to turn around and go back the way I was coming from and have people ask me, Where the F did you come from? I play it off by telling people I'm a ninja, but if I put my mind to it, I could probably get away with some crazy stuff. Story 18. I grew up poor. In third grade, there was this rich girl in my class who always bragged about the vacations she went on and would bring in the latest, most expensive toys to show off. She wouldn't let anyone touch them, and she'd parade them around to all the other less fortunate kids and smugly ask, Don't you wish you had this? She called other kids including me, poor and dirty. We may have been poor, but we weren't dirty. She said we didn't deserve what she had. Unsurprisingly, no one liked her aside from a handful of suck-ups. One day she brought in some sort of dinosaur trading cards and was bragging about how rare they were. This was the 80s and no one else in the class had something like that at the time. The teacher made her put them in her desk and said she could take them out again at break time. When it was break time, she went to the washroom, at which point I stole the cards from inside her desk. A couple other kids saw me, but because no one liked her, we just had a giggle about it. I stuck them inside the bottom of my shoes. She came back and right away went to look for the cards in her desk and immediately started freaking out and accusing everyone in the vicinity of taking them. Of course, everyone including me feigned innocence. She broke down and started screaming and pushing over desks, which granted her a reprimand and lines from the teacher. Her parents were called to pick her up because she would not calm down. She was still a nasty little turd after that, but she never brought her stuff in to rub it in anyone's face again. As for the cards, I kept them in my shoes until I got home, and then ripped them up and put them in the garbage so there was no way I'd be found out. That was the worst thing I ever did, and I don't regret it a bit.